Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And welcome to the online video worship service for the Riceville United Methodist Church for Sunday, October the 24th in the year of our Lord, 2021. We're so glad that you've joined us today for this video worship service. Uh, you'll see in a moment a QR code on the screen. We would appreciate it if you would scan that with your phone and register your attendance so that we uh, know who is watching the video this week. Once again, welcome to our worship service. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Join with me now for our opening prayer. O oh God, our guide and our guardian, you have led us apart from the busy world into the quietness of your presence. Grant us grace to worship you in spirit and in truth, to the comfort of our souls and the upbuilding of every good purpose and holy desire. Enable us to do more perfectly the work to which you have called us, that we may not fear the coming of night. So may we worship you, not with our lips at this hour, but in word and deed all the days of our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray, amen. using the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today I will be reading Psalms 119, verse 12 through 24. Praise be to you, Lord, teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not ne neglect your word. Be good to your servant while I live. That I may obey your word. Open my eyes. That I may see wonderful things in your law. I am a stranger on earth. I do not hide your commands from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. You rebuke the arrogant who are accursed. Those who stray from your commands remove from me their scorn and contempt. For I keep your statutes through rulers sit together and slander me. Your servant will meditate on your decrees. Your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As a fire is meant for burning with a bright and warming flame, so the church is meant for mission, giving glory to God's name. Not to preach our creeds or customs, but to build a bridge of care. We join hands across the nation, finding neighbors everywhere. We are learners, we are teachers, we are pilgrims on the way. We are seekers, we are givers, we are vessels made of clay. By our gentle, loving actions, we would show that Christ is life. In an humble, listening spirit, we would live to God's delight. As a green bud in the springtime is a sign of life renewed, so may we be signs of oneness in our people's many hue. As a rainbow lights the heavens when a storm is past and gone, may our lives reflect the radiance of God's new and glorious dawn. As we prepare once again to go before God in prayer, uh, I'll just remind you that during the prayer, I'll be pausing to give you the opportunity to name the names of those that you would like to remember in prayer today. And you may do that by speaking their names out loud or speaking them in the quietness of your hearts. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, you are always more ready to bestow your good gifts on us than we are to seek them and are willing to give more than we desire or deserve. Help us so to seek that we may truly find. Help us so to ask that we may joyfully receive. Help us so to knock that the door of your mercy may be open to us. And now we especially pray today for these whom we now name with our voices or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your promise to never forsake us or leave us. Help us to live lives through which you bless others. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. And as he taught his disciples to pray, so now we also pray as God's confident children praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. My name is Richard Morrison and I am the chairman of our church finance committee. In that capacity, I am committed to reviewing our church finances on a monthly and weekly and often on a daily basis. I've had the privilege to be a member of this important committee for 15 years, chairing it the last two years. Fortunately, during all those years, we have enjoyed a solid financial position. And indeed, during those 15 years, we averaged an annual surplus at the end of the year. Hence, we always ended the calendar year financially strong, which was due in great part to exceptional fourth quarter collections. And then the COVID pandemic hit us, and our financial strength has suffered, especially this year. Last year, we were able to get some relief because we were the recipient of a PPP, the Federal Paycheck Protection Program. We were the recipient of a grant of $154,000, which we will not have this year. The financial numbers on the back of our Sunday bulletin each week are financial numbers that track our cash flow. And those numbers are very important because they relate to our revenues, our cash in and our expenditures, our cash out. Now our trend so far this year has been consistent in showing a significant negative cash flow. And that's not good. For your information, we do run our church operations on a tight budget and we work hard to maintain significant cash to cover our operating and outreach financial commitments and needs, which by the way is managed extremely well by our dedicated pastors and staff. Allow me to share a couple of numbers. From January through September this year, we had a negative cash flow of a little over $142,000. Last year, at that same time, we had a positive cash flow of a little over $24,000. That means at the start of this month, this year, this month, October, we had a negative cash flow of $166,500 compared to last year. Now, as we know, uh, at least we expect that we will receive strong collections in November, especially in December, but our projections, which includes normal enhanced December revenues, show that if we do nothing, we will finish the year with a negative financial position of around $63,000, and indeed it could be much higher. Hence, we simply must do something to avoid this unfavorable year-end financial result. With that in mind, I recently organized a small group of church members to brainstorm our financial needs and strategies. And last week, the Finance Committee met and we discussed this very issue. And also, we started the development uh, and working uh, with a pandemic-related budget for next year because the possibility that the pandemic, to some degree, will still be with us uh, next year exists. Therefore, considering all of this, the Finance Committee is asking our church membership to consider giving an additional financial gift before year in, in addition to your normal monthly giving. Now, please know that we fully understand that many families will be unable to consider enhanced giving, and that's okay. Now, like what most all of you likely do in your families, my wife and I have discussed our year-end stewardship, specifically as it relates to, relates to our financial gifts. And because we believe what is said in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, we are giving an additional gift over and above our normal tithe, and I ask you to consider doing the same. The bottom line is that if our congregants will give additional financial gifts starting now and in the days ahead, we will finish this year financially sound. So on behalf of Pastors Doug, Julia, 
and David and the entire church staff and the members of the Finance Committee and myself, I thank you in advance for your understanding and support of our financial situation. And I assure you that we will be transparent with regard to our financial status going forward, not only for the remainder of this year, but as we enjoy another year in 2022 of worship and holy life and enjoyment here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. Thank you and God bless. Good morning, I'm Pastor David Haley, one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist, and it's my joy to bring the children's message today. So if you have children or youth nearby who aren't already watching the video, now's a great time to call them over because I have some things to share with them. So, hello guys. Um, you know, sometimes it's good to just reintroduce ourselves. Now, I'm Pastor David, and now I, I want you all to tell me your name and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna count to three and then you just all say your names at once, okay? One, two, three. You know, I, did I hear Wonder Woman? Luke Skywalker? Harry Potter? Supergirl? How am I doing so far? Terrible. Well, you know, it's kind of hard to, uh, it's kind of hard to hear all the names of everybody talking at once. 
Um, I guess that's why I got so many of them wrong. Did I get any of them right? No. Oh. Well, it was pretty loud there for a moment when you were all saying your names at the same time. So what do you think would have worked better? Oh yeah, we could have let each person go one at a time and tell me their name. Of course, there's a lot of you out there, so that might have taken a while. Well, in today's scripture story that uh, Pastor Doug is going to read for us in just a moment, Jesus and another teacher spoke with each other about the most important thing that we can do to help us to pay attention to God so we can be sure that we hear God when God speaks. And they agreed that the most important thing is to listen to God and love God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. So just a few moments ago, it was so noisy, I couldn't even hear your names. If life is that noisy, how am I or anyone else going to be able to really listen to God? We have to concentrate on loving God and making that a priority in our lives and also loving and helping others. That's what Jesus taught us to do. And when we do these two things, love God, love and help others, and concentrate on them, it's a lot easier for us to pay attention to God when God speaks to us. And that's the good news for today. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for Jesus who shows us how to listen to you in the noisiness of our lives. Bless the children and youth watching this video and their families. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hello, I'm Doug Lane, senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. I'm so glad that you took the time to watch this video and be a part of our worship service today. We're continuing wrestling with some really difficult questions in the gospel according to Mark. And today we're in chapter 12. We're going to pick up in verse 28. Hear the word of the Lord. One of the scribes came near and heard them, talking about the disciples, disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked them, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy God, you continue to reach out to us and you continue to teach us. Father, wherever we may be today, speak to us anew so that we might hear your word and heed your word. In Jesus' name, amen. A minister dies and is waiting in line at the pearly gates. Ahead of him is a guy who's dressed in sunglasses, a loud shirt, leather jacket, and jeans. St. Peter addresses this guy. Who are you so that I may know whether or not to admit you to the kingdom of heaven? The guy replies, I'm Joe Cohen of New York City. I drove a cab for 25 years. St. Peter consults his list. He smiles and says to the taxi driver, take this silken robe and golden staff and enter the kingdom of heaven. The taxi driver goes into heaven with his robe and his staff and now it's the minister's turn. He stands erect and booms out, I am Father Joseph Snow, pastor of St. Mary's for the past 43 years. St. Peter consults his list, and he says to the minister, take this cotton robe and wooden staff and enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Wait, just a minute, said the minister. That man was a taxi driver and he gets a silken robe and a golden staff? How can this be? Well, up here we work by results, said St. Peter. While you preached, people slept. While he drove, people prayed. Our scripture for today describes a discussion of the great commandment. An unnamed scribe came to Jesus asking him a question. It was a legitimate inquiry. We have no reason to believe that the inquirer had any special agenda to try to trick Jesus. But it's important to recognize that the man is a scribe. His business was recording the scriptures. Long before the invention of the printing press, all documents were executed by hand. What a tiresome, monotonous job. Day in, day out, copying the same passages over and over again. Through sheer rote, words would have been fixed in this man's mind, in just an unconscious memory. Of course he knew the law. He'd copied it, perhaps hundreds, maybe even thousands of times, over and over. He's not your average Joe. He is steeped in the law. And he comes up to Jesus wanting to know which of the commandments that he writes every day is the greatest. When Jesus gave him the Shema, found in Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19, the scribe simply noted that here was the whole matter. He observed that these simple, direct phrases had more significance than all the sacrificial offerings made at the temple. It all appeared very logical and compact. And for once, excessive verbiage was cast aside. We can almost see the smile on Jesus' face as he looked at the honest scribe and said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. One of the joys of teaching comes when a student suddenly gets it. You know, they catch a major point, that light bulb goes off, and then in a brief and comprehensive statement, they wrap it all up with clarity and understanding. I love those moments. So refreshing. Well, in this case, a scribe who knew his Bible reduced it, without rejecting any part of it, to the most salient points of faith. He realized that the old concept of sacrificial offerings did not constitute the major thrust of God's Word. Here was an individual who stood within a hair's breadth of God's kingdom. He's no longer majoring in minors. He's keeping the main thing the main thing. He's putting first things first. He discovered that everything else revolved around this one thing. But in our sophisticated day, we've become more cynical. Human nature never changes, we say, over and over again. We look around us and insist that people remain the same selfish, stubborn individuals regardless of external circumstances. Conversion? Yeah, maybe, possibly, but underneath we think human nature basically remains the same. Is that what we really believe? It may come as a surprise, but the Christian gospel brings an altogether different point of view. We believe that human nature can be changed, that people do not need to remain the same. In short, none of us are far from the kingdom of God. Take Nicodemus, for example. He's a brilliant member of the Sanhedrin, one very wealthy in both riches and honors. And he comes to Jesus by night. He says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God be with him. Jesus then shared with Nicodemus the secret. You must be born anew, he tells him. Some translations say born again or born from above. Nicodemus had come under cover of darkness to avoid prying eyes around him. He was, after all, a respected leader, a doctor of the law. He was on an honest, bona fide search. Yet his intellectual being looked upon the concept of rebirth as a scientific impossibility. Even spiritual rebirth puzzled this man. Jesus made it ever so clear. Entering the kingdom of God is as radical as the process of physical birth. One leaves one state, the womb, wherein the atmosphere is essentially liquid, and one enters an environment in which oxygen is now the condition for breathing. 
birth is a shock. It is radical. But it's necessary to avoid suffocation in the womb. Jesus is telling Nicodemus that coming to the kingdom of God is no less radical. It is no less essential. Did Nicodemus, who was not far, enter the kingdom? We know he undertook a rather cautious, legalistic defense of Jesus against the Pharisee in John chapter 7. He's also present at the crucifixion in John chapter 19. There are legends without any biblical foundation claiming that Nicodemus was baptized by Peter and John and then driven from Jerusalem at the time of Stephen's death. It's always been my hope that Nicodemus had become a follower. I think he had. And that new birth had become a reality. For indeed, he was not far. What about Paul, a young Pharisee who was desperate in his pursuit of God's approval? He prided himself on his impeccable background. He said he was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. As to the law of Pharisee, he said, he proudly stated, I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my own age. So extremely zealous was I for the tradition of my fathers. It was the law and the exhausting attempts to keep it that drove the man once named Saul of Tarsus to persecute those who belonged to the way. In that famous trip to Damascus, Saul, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, encountered the same God who inquired, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? All was changed. Not in a moment, not in a day, not in a week, but a change took place. Indeed, many days and many people were party to that amazing transformation, not the least of which was the gentle Ananias, who greeted the young Pharisee as Brother Paul. So it was that Saul gradually became Paul. Few people have experienced so dynamic a transformation. Physical, moral, mental, spiritual influences played a huge part in bringing about a new individual. Paul simply grasped the hand of the Lord and refused to let it go. Following God's call to Asia Minor and then to Europe, he suffered going to prison, being whipped, shipwrecked, mobs. It mattered not. Until the very end, a martyr's death, he insisted. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But even as far back as the stoning of Stephen, Paul was not far. Then there's St. Augustine, a youth born in the north of Africa. He tells of his long, intense struggle with his pride, his self-will, even his sexual promiscuity. His mother prayed for him. His father gave very little guidance. It was during university days at Carthage which he described as a hissing cauldron of lust, that the 17-year-old Augustine took a mistress and fathered a child. Augustine sought out answers by studying philosophy, especially the high ideals of Plato. It was all an exhilarating time, and he prayed to God, give me chastity and continence, but not yet. How many of us have prayed that? Augustine left Africa for bigger plums at Rome and Milan. In his celebrated book titled Confessions, he tells the world all that he thought and did. Monica, his mother, continued to pray for her wayward son, and the great Ambrose gave direction to him from the pulpit. It was traumatic wrestling, wrestling with this guilt-ridden, debased feeling. Finally, in September of A.D. 386, in a garden in Milan, Augustine experienced his own personal Gethsemane. Tearing his hair, clutching his knees, wringing his hands, asking why God would not come and hear him. I was frantic, he wrote, overcome by violent anger with myself for not accepting your will and entering into your covenant. And at that moment, he heard the voice of a child. Take and read, which prompted him to pick up his Bible, 
to Romans chapter 13, where it says, Not in reveling and drunkenness, arm yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Spend no more thought on nature and nature's appetites. And it was accomplished. Augustine was a new creation in Jesus Christ. The remainder of the story is the evolution of one of Christendom's giants of theology, faith, and the life of the church. His confessions continue to radiate as a star of in, in this intellectual and spiritual universe. Few have so beautifully poured out praise to God like Augustine. His years were spent in powerful, eloquent, aggressive witness as the Bishop of Hippo. To be certain, Augustine was not far. There's John Wesley. The year was 1738. John Wesley was back in England, having experienced a less than satisfactory missionary trip to the new colony of Georgia. He was downcast. Why had Georgia turned out not to be this rich, rewarding time that he had anticipated? After all, he held a distinguished degree from Oxford. He was an ordained priest in the Church of England. One Georgia citizen boldly accosted John Wesley, saying, We be Christians. We know not what you be. Apparently it was due to John's textbook approach to ministry, which resulted in him stumbling over his own feet. He wrote, all the time I was in Savannah, I was beating the air. Well, now it's May 24th, 1738, and John carefully records the events of the day. At 5 a.m., he read from 2 Peter, there are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Hmm. Later that morning, he opened his Bible to today's passage from Mark 12, verse 34, reading, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. At noon, Wesley attended services at St. Paul's, where the choir used Henry Purcell's rendition of Psalm 130 that says, Out of the deep have I called to thee, O Lord, which just goes to show that God just as frequently speaks to us through music as much as the sermon. The day is fast closing and Wesley didn't want to go to prayer meeting, which also goes to show you shouldn't stay away from church because you don't feel like going. God just might have a special blessing for you. And even so, Wesley went to this prayer service that he didn't want to go to at Aldersgate Street in London. William Holland was the man who was reading Luther's preface to the Romans. And John wrote in his journal, In the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. John Wesley became a transformed man who in turn helped transform sinners by God's grace. Even as he read that morning on May 24th, he was not far. Now let me introduce a contemporary. To this day, Sarah Miles doesn't know why she walked into St. Gregory of Nyssa Episcopal Church in San Francisco more than a decade ago. All she knows is that it changed her life. A restaurant cook who was raised as an atheist, Miles underwent an inexplicable conversion from non-believer to self-proclaimed Jesus freak. The day she was baptized, she established a food pantry as part of St. Gregory's outreach mission. I was not a Christian, she said. I didn't go to church. And here I was taking communion. I didn't feel comfortable at all. I felt completely shocked, scandalized, and horrified at myself. So shocked, in fact, that she abruptly walked back out of the church. And yet, something drew her back in. Turned out I was hungry for something I hadn't known I was hungry for. In, 2007, in her 2007 personal memoir, Take This Bread, A Radical Conversion, Miles wrote, Eating Jesus, as I did that day, to my great astonishment, 
led me against all my expectations to a faith that I had scorned and thought I'd never imagined. The mysterious sacrament turned out to be not a symbolic wafer at all, but actual food, indeed the bread of life. In that shocking moment of communion, filled with a deep desire to reach for and become part of a body, I realized what I'd been doing with my whole life all along was what I was meant to do. That was to feed people. There was, she acknowledged, a blinding moment of revelation. I was followed by a lot of confusion and frustration. Over that next year, she said, I wrestled with it. The weekend I decided to be baptized was the weekend I started the food pantry. What I was getting at the altar table led me to continue to feed people around that same altar table. In the years since her baptism, Miles has had a hand in establishing 18 additional food pantries throughout San Francisco. The pantries, which are open to anyone, are heavily used by the elderly and the working poor who have a hard time making ends meet in a city where spending on housing is growing at twice the national rate. A lot of our people that come to the food pantry are working, she said. There are also a lot of elderly people who are living with several generations in their homes. Their kids are often working several jobs, so their job is to come out and get the food. She sees a link between using our relationship with God through our worship to shape our relationships with others. I think it could easily be said, she's not far. What does this all mean? As we've been examining the experiences of those who are not far, we can't help but ask, well, what about us? They move from not far to the kingdom itself. Why can't we have a similar encounter? More than once, back during 19th century revivalism, the sinners were admonished to pray for forgiveness, to come to the mourner's bench and to seek God's pardoning power. And they came, awash in tears, and the saints joined them to pray them through, which often lasted into the early hours of the morning. But alas, for many, after fervent prayer, some would rise to their knees, unchanged, untouched. They felt nothing in their hearts. And they silently asked, why? You ever felt a similar emptiness? You're not alone. Let us consider some of the questions which have been asked. Number one, does God want me? Yes, God wants you. And you may be sure that God has never rejected you. He did not reject the scribe, nor Nicodemus, nor Paul, Augustine, John Wesley, Sarah Miles, or any of us. Number two, am I good enough? Well, actually, no, I'm afraid not. You're not good enough, and neither am I. Neither were those I just named. Nobody's good enough. It's not a matter of our goodness. It's a matter of God's goodness. We are blessed through his grace. Which brings us to question three. So am I supposed to change myself? Well, yes and no. God will do the changing, but in faith we must seek to put ourselves in the right atmosphere, in the right circumstance where we can best hear God's voice and experience God's presence. Number four, well, what should we do? Well, do what the saints have always done. Cultivate the holy habits of private prayer, and Bible reading, attendance in worship or online, participating in the fellowship the church with others? Have eyes of compassion for the human needs you see around you? Extend a hand of help and healing whenever possible? You know, back during the summer, I asked if you would pray five times a day. Are you still doing that? Or reading five verses a day? Attending to worship? Helping and sharing with others? Number five, will God invite me in some particular way? No, the invitation usually comes in a manner 
commensurate with the personality of that individual. We're all different. We're going to respond in different ways. And so you're going to be called differently from your neighbor. Just because they were called in that way doesn't mean you'll be called in the same way. It's probably going to be different. So six, the biggest question. How will you respond? The God who meets you in faith is the God who wanted you when you were not far. And trust me, none of us are very far from the kingdom of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Holy God, I thank you for your son Jesus who comes to us, bringing the kingdom with him so that none of us are far. We simply have to receive and accept your grace. Father, help us to take that step, to say yes to you, to enter the kingdom, and to love others like you love us. Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thanks again for taking the time to join us for worship today. I want to tell you about a couple of upcoming events, um, places where you can connect with others, including this very evening, Sunday night, here at the church at 530. We're having our very last Extend the Walk, which is a time to talk about today's sermon as we walk the loop. You can meet right here at the church at 530. And also, I want to go ahead and put it on your radar screen that we're going to be collecting items for our annual yard sale beginning November the 9th. November the 9th. And then the yard sale will be the 12th and the 13th, in which we will sell items to raise money for Rotafunk Hospital in Sierra Leone, a women and children's hospital in an area of the world where... Uh, the maternal and infant death rates are sky high. So we can make a difference right here through the yard sale by just giving away things that we don't even use anymore. So that's November the 9th. We start to collect those items. Thanks a lot for taking the time to consider that. And remember, wherever you are in your life, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Go in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.